Hello and welcome to another edition of On the Line, Perspectives on Partition, organised by the Bloody Sunday Trust, in which prominent people from political and community backgrounds share their thoughts on one of the most seismic events in modern Irish history, the partition of the island, a hundred years ago this year. My name is Paul McFadden and our guest today is a Deputy Leader of the Green Party Northern Ireland and a member of Belfast City Council. You might wonder what a party whose primary focus is on a vast and imminent crisis, the well-being of our planet, has to say, if anything, about an issue as ancient and arguably as trivial as partition, which concerns a very short line across a very small island on the periphery of Western Europe. And that essentially is what we're going to explore today with our guest, Councillor Malachi O'Hara. Um, Malachi, uh, Thank you very much indeed for joining us, first of all, for agreeing to go on the line with your, your thoughts, your perspectives on partition. In the grand scheme of issues, uh, how important is something like partition? Something as small as I say, something that happened 100 years ago. It bedevils politics locally, of course, but in the grand scheme of things, how much does it matter to someone like you? Well, I think... Um, you know, growing up in this place, Paul, all of us, you know, have a view, have an idea, have a, maybe a position about where we stand in relation to the constitutional question and then attending to that, the conflict. But I think, I think it would be a misnomer to say that, you know, people within the Green Party don't care about this issue. We do. We have a position. But actually what unites us rather than dividing us is that there are other issues that we believe are much more important um, in, in terms of just the constitutional question. And I think um, because of the conflict here, what we have seen is the emergence of political parties that are primarily um, divisible against one another based on the constitutional question and where they stand on it. And, you know, as we emerge uh, from conflict and we become a more normalized society, I would like to see us move towards a more left-right understanding of politics and for more and more people to begin to analyse politics uh, that way. I think that's not to say that the constitutional question or the border is not important, but rather there is a fixed time and a place for that discussion and that conversation, and it shouldn't permeate every single political decision or political issue that we discuss and debate. I think very often we have a a reflex in Northern Ireland, which is to constitutionalize everything or, you know, pair it back to that idea of the two big binary communities. But more and more people are turning away from that. And I think you see with the growth of the vote for the others, particularly, you know, ourselves, Alliance, people before profit, that more and more people are beginning to say, yes, I have a, a preference or a leaning in regards to the constitution, but it's not going to be the dominant headline in how I vote or how I perceive policy or discuss other wider issues. But does the constitutional issue ever intrude into um, not so much Green Party politics, but relations within the Green Party in Northern Ireland? Because it, it is a big issue for people here and it, it's almost uh, inconceivable. You might correct me, but it seems almost inconceivable to me that it never intrudes, that it never seeps or leaks into political discussions, even among members of the Green Party. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, and there are people within my party, you know, who are nationalist, Republican, unionist, loyalist, other, um, and, uh, you know, globalist, we don't care about it, we're internationalist, you know, we're, we're maybe left of centre or socialist, and that's our primary, you know, those might be the, uh, the primary issues that we care about. But yes, of course, people will have different perspectives on them. But I think for us as a party and a movement, actually the issues that we're on the same page on, which unite us, um, so those issues around social justice, equality, the environment, biodiversity, grassroots democracy, we're much more united on those issues than the maybe policy differences that we have when a border poll, when it comes, where we might stand on that. And I think that's actually quite mature and quite grown up that people from very different backgrounds constitutionally can be in the same party because in their own understanding of how they rank what's most important, the constitutional issue doesn't maybe factor in the top five or the top 10 issues for people. Can I ask you about your, well, for your view on partition, a hundred years ago this year, it, it has, you know, it has affected 
uh, politics on this island for sure, politics within these islands uh, for probably all of those 100 years since. Um, what is your view, uh, looking back at, at that seismic, uh, a seismic event in our history? Um, so Paul, I'm called Malik O'Hara. There's a fada in there. You can kind of <laughs> guess what my community it's background might be. Yeah, there's a couple of them, if I spell it correctly. But, um, you know, I, I think there's sometimes an easy narrative or a lazy narrative in Northern Ireland that goes, well, he's called Malik O'Hara, so he must have these leanings, right? Um, and I think, you know, my own personal story, um, I'm... I'm working class, I'm gay, um, I'm from a broadly nationalist Republican community background. I was raised Catholic, I'm a practicing atheist, if atheist practice. But, you know, I went, I went to England in 1998. My first boyfriend was an RAF reservist at university when at that time he could have been excluded from the army because they had, you know, no open LGBT people were to serve in the armed forces at that time. Um, I lived in Birmingham in England for seven years. I worked and studied there. Um, and, you know, I think for me, my perspective kind of moved, particularly living in Birmingham, um, you know, my perspective moved where it might have historically been. Um, I suppose I might be from a background that's inclined to say yes to reunification, but not at all costs and not at, without a really considered discussion. I think we don't want to repeat the mistakes of Brexit. We're still trying to see what does Brexit actually mean? What are the outworkings of Brexit? Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of that mess recently and we're still experiencing that. So I think if we're to have any conversation around the constitutional status of Northern Ireland, it needs to be done in a considered, measured way. And as a party, we're champions of the idea of a constitutional, or, or sorry, a citizens assembly. Um, and that model's being used in the South to address issues which are potentially controversial, such as abortion, same-sex marriage, the environment, the Senate, the presidency, etc. And that's a way to tease out an informed societal debate around controversial or complex political issues. And I think the Citizens' Assembly is a model that we should use. From my own perspective, um, you know, I think we almost, you know, people will have different perspectives on partition. Some will think it was a good thing. Some will think it was a terrible thing and all of the shades of opinion in between. And I think actually for us, we would rather look forward to the existential crisis of our time, which is the climate and biodiversity emergency, rather than focusing and always harking back to the past and resurrecting those old arguments. I think the Good Friday Agreement settled the constitutional question for Northern Ireland until it is the time of a border poll, when we'll open that conversation again. While looking forward to the existential crisis of our time, as you describe it, it, it makes a difference, surely, uh, for a gay man um, to be on one side of this line we're talking about, which is the centre point of this discussion today, or the other side of that line, because, you know, the, 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 the situation or the predicament in which a gay man might find himself. It's very different. They're very different experiences, depending on which side of that lane you find yourself. Yeah, and you know, that's really interesting. I think the historic understanding was, you know, the South was was very religious, very conservative, and we have seen huge sea change in attitudes around social liberalism, things that I really welcome, whether it's the repeal of the Eighth Amendment or you know, the Republic becoming the first country in the world to change its constitution to allow for same-sex marriage. But I don't think, and, and the historic equivalent to that is that the North was more socially liberal. But I would hesitate at that and say, actually, you know, from we have had a restored assembly in the North, that we have, the executive has singularly failed to advance LGBT equality in Northern Ireland. All of our rights are, have come from extensions of Westminster legislation or through court battles. Um, so in Northern Ireland, you know, one of the things I'm proud of is the LGBTQ movement here in terms of agitating for our rights, being resilient in the face of adversity, and, you know, seeing very limited progress from our local devolved assembly, but still campaigning for change. And I think that's something I'm proud of in Northern Ireland. Um, I think 
uh, we've caught up in marriage in the north. So, you know, the issues, whether I was born on one side of the border or, or another, I'd still be facing them. There are issues around hate crime, health inequalities, access to goods and services. And then for my brothers and sisters in the, the wider LGBT movement, that's access to IVF, that's trans health care and self-identification, um, you know, and, and um, relationship and sex ed in the curriculum and a whole host of other other issues that maybe haven't been addressed, definitely not in the North, or there's been incremental progress in the South. Uh, I, I wonder, does the fact that any of the, the major gains that you have seen in, in recent years, that they have come uh, uh, at, at the behest of, of London, essentially, is that a kind of an argument for continued membership of the Union? You know, because I mean, we, I think we're possibly a long way off um, seeing the day when uh, a 32 county Ireland and whatever guys it may or may not arise would address in a meaningful way from your point of view, the kind of issues that, that you're that you're focusing on. Yeah, I, I, and I think people who are pro-union have missed this trick. I have been saying to my unionist colleagues and friends, you know, um, I think there's there's evidence from uh, Paul Pugh's research from the Liverpool of, uh, Liverpool University about you know people under fifty who are broadly unionist background are more socially liberal than other cohorts of demographics in Northern Ireland, but unionism is failing to represent those people, um, and I think that's why over recent years you've seen a drift to people voting for whether it's the Greens or Alliance, who are traditionally unionist community background. Um, I think, and that's because when you look at unionism, it's writ large that it's social conservatism. So people who are maybe socially liberal on issues of abortion or on you know issues of LGBT equality or on the issue of the environment, when they look to unionism, those political parties, big house unionism, the DUP, and large parts of the Ulster Unionist, don't represent those people, so they go elsewhere and they might vote Green or they might vote Alliance. Um, but I think when it comes to the constitutional question, if we do have a border poll, those people might vote to maintain the union um, because they see that uh, most of the advances in terms of LGBT equality have come directly from Westminster. Uh, can we ever re realistically look, look forward to the day in which uh orange and green politics are done away with here and green politics, you know, come to the fore. Yeah. I, I mean, real it's a different shade, different shade of green, Paul, you know, we've or got 40 or so oh. on this island. Um, I mean, look, I, I, do, I don't ever want to denigrate the importance that people put on the constitutional question. I, I think that would be dismissive. Um, but what I would encourage people to do is don't let that be the primary motivator for when you vote in elections. Look at social economic issues, look at the environment, look at social justice, look at equality, and then vote based on those issues because the time will come when we have to vote uh, on a border poll or the constitutional status of Northern Ireland and save your vote on that issue for when you're being asked about that. And I think what happens is that too often people reflex or default to go, I must vote for a unionist party or I must vote for a nationalist party. It's a council election or it's an assembly election to set the direction for the next four or five years on local services, on key priorities, addressing the economy, the environment, health, education, etc. And you're letting that be informed by a constitutional status and maybe giving too much weight to that. So I would always be encouraging people to actually look at the socioeconomic issues rather than the constitutional question when they come to vote. It's very kind of you to introduce the uh, issue of a, a, a border poll, for example, there. Um, you know, uh, wh where does the Green Party stand on something which is as immediate as that, as sensitive as that, as controversial as that, possibly as divisive as that? Where, where does your party stand on it? Should we have one in the very near future? Or is it too divisive? What exactly does the Green Party have to say about it? Well, as a party, we're supporters of the Good Friday Agreement. The mechanism for a border poll is in the Good Friday Agreement. Um, I have chastised my my nationalist Republican friends, you know, saying, excuse me, saying to them, 
You've had 23 years to get clarity from a Secretary of State about what the trigger is for a border poll, um, you know, rather than just leaving it to their purview. Is it a change in unionism, not being a majority at Assembly, not being a majority at Councils, not being a majority at Westminster? You know, uh, is it nationalism becoming a majority in those electoral environments? What is the mechanism? And I think that's what we need a bit of clarity on. So we need to understand the mechanism um, for having a border poll. Um, and I think, you know, that goes back to the Good Friday Agreement. And I think um, as we would prefer that that's done at a grassroots level, we, we're a party that supports grassroots democracy. Um, and that means that decision making should be made at the most effective lowest level. Um, and that's not currently where we are. So I think what we need is that space for the citizens assembly to begin having these informed conversations, Paul, about when does a border poll happen? When should it happen? What does the question look like? How, you know, is it a simple majority? Is it a weighted majority? You know, all of those type of questions, I think need hammered out from a societal um, perspective. I think what we've seen over the last 23 years is a political process rather than a peace process. We've seen the Good Friday Agreement changed. We've had, you know, uh, St Andrew's Agreement, the Stormont House Agreement, Haas, uh, Stormont, you know, fresh start. I can't believe it's not a fresh start. You know, all of those agreements have been vested political party interests sitting down, hammering out something that suits them and changing the Good Friday Agreement rather than going back to society and saying, how can we plot a way forward, which brings as many people with us rather than just serves the interest of those big political parties. With the benefit of hindsight, is it a weakness in the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement that it wasn't more specific um, on the uh, circumstances that would, or the conditions that, that would, I suppose, require a border poll to be taken. I mean, there's so much power vested in the Secretary of State, whoever she or he happens to be at the time. It's it's within their gift whether it happens at all or not. They have to be convinced that there's likely to be or possibly going to be a change. Yeah, and I think, you know, at the time of the Good Friday Agreement, I think it's fair to say that there were creative ambiguities in, in the agreement. Um, and that's part because we had to get what we could over the line with as much consensus around it as possible so that we could begin, you know, to take forward the peace process, to end violence, to, you know, um, to, to bring locally devolved institutions which were accountable to the people. Um, you know, we did that whether it was on victims and survivors, we did that, um, you know, on, on a on a range of other issues because they just simply couldn't be solved at that time. So I think it would be churlish to look back and say the agreement wasn't perfect, but it was the best deal we could get at the time. And that's why we think as a party, a citizens assembly to look at that, um, you know, we were, we were promised integrated education. That hasn't happened. We were promised a prosperity. Um, that hasn't trickled down. The areas that were deprived in 1998 are the same areas that are deprived, and lots of them in my area of North Belfast and, you know, up in Foyle as well. Um, we haven't seen that kind of economic dividend for people, which would help move us out of conflict or that phase of conflict. So I think we would be championing going back to the idea of citizens' assemblies to reinvigorate the Good Friday Agreement, and if we need to make changes to it and move forward on some of those creative ambiguities that we had, then that's the process to do it. Rather than putting the power in the hands of vested political parties and interests, put it back to people and actually get as much consensus as possible to go forward. The change can occur, you know, um, as a result of, of um, changing within demographics and stuff like that. And uh, sometimes, of course, that can be almost glacial or it can feel glacial. But it, it's interesting when you speak to groups of young people, um, they, they seem to be in a different place. And I'm not sure what your age is, Malachi, but I mean, I'm, I'm a, a 60 year old man and they're in a very different place to me, if I'm being honest, you know. Mm. And I wonder if the kind of what, what many people of my generation might regard as very liberal uh, kinds of uh, political developments or people others might describe as very progressive. Are, are those things inevitably going to happen as a result of demographic change or 
or does something happen to young people that, that, uh, that at some point in their lives where they, they kind of move into the kind of trenches that people of my generation occupy? I think it's an interesting question, Paul. You know, there's that old adage that we drift to the right as we get older. I, I don't know. I, I seem to be drifting further left myself. Um, which, you, you know, is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I, I, but I think um, in terms of young people, um, you know, I, I have the privilege that my background is youth and community work. And, um, you know, until this time last year, I was doing some sessional youth work, um, which was around good relations and peace building. Um, and, you know, young people are a bit more, sometimes some young people are morbidly fascinated with the troubles and what was it really like? And was it really that bad? But the, there's almost a nonchalance sometimes from them that's about, you know, they think people are a bit old fashioned or a bit ridiculous. You know, you hear those things people say still, you know, I'd be wary walking across or through that estate to get to somewhere because it's seen as the other side's estate. Young people have a lot less inhibitions around those. Now, there's still certainly some areas where young people are wary. Um, but generally, young people associate much more with people from different community backgrounds than people maybe of my generation or yours did, Paul. Um, which is a really good thing, but I think there's a fundamental feeling here, um, you know, and I would be critical of the NI executive in terms of how they've driven forward more integrated communities. You know, we have the T-Box strategy of um, uh, good relations, um, and it, you know, one of the main things it does is the summer camps, and that's bring young people away for a week, get, you know, get them together and expect magic to happen. But then we send them back to segregated communities and segregated schools. So I think what we really need to do is ramp up that um, shared housing and shared schooling, which will really move us forward in breaking down boundaries. Um, I think young people are much more socially liberal. I think they're much more clued in about the environment. Um, the difficulty is that young people maybe don't vote as much as older people at the moment. So we need to do a body of work um, to give young people more of a stake in the political process. And I think we need to more authentically hear their voice on these issues. Sometimes that can be done very tokenistically. But if you talk to young people, the climate is one of the key issues for them. They're the generation who are going to live longest with that. They're going to see the outworking of that. They're going to see 2050 if we don't avert catastrophic climate change and keep sea uh, level rises below a certain level and we don't see let temperature chains go above that 1.5 degrees. Um, young people are going to bear the brunt of that and they're going to see that all across their lives. So they are eager for us to make systemic change right now. And, you know, I'm, I'm someone who supports systemic change in that if we change society to cope with the climate and biodiversity crisis, we can use it as an opportunity to create a much more equal society. And I mean equality in terms of wealth distribution, power, um, and equality of opportunity. And I think we can do that while committing to a transition to a carbon neutral economy and a, and a just transition that facilitates that. If systemic change on the scale that you would like to see it occurring is to happen, realistically, who is going to deliver that? Is it going to be the Green Party because, you know, uh, the vast majority or, or a sufficiently large majority within the community have some kind of a, 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 almost a religious conversion or something? Or is it that, that your efforts at evangelization pay off um, to the extent where you kind of persuade traditional parties to embrace Green Party imperatives, environmental imperatives and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and that they deliver the kind of change that you want to see happening? Um, I think it's both. Ideally, at the assembly election next year, we'll stand 18 candidates and we'll get 18 MLAs and there'll be a huge sea change in how things are done um, with that regards. You have in mind, Margie, 18, Sorry? is that the target you have in mind, 18? No, yeah. no, I'm just, no, we're still working through that, you know, but the ideal would be every candidate we stand gets elected um, and that would be a huge sea change. But I think, Paul, over the last number of years, we've acted on the progressive vanguard for social change. So obviously as a party, you know, we're centered around environmentalism. We've been talking about that issue for almost four decades. 
and you can see over the last couple of years, um, you know, as we make strides in environment, or sorry, in electoral gains, other parties are beginning to center more and more environmental issues in their policy. That's great, and that's really welcome. Um, and also you see young people out, whether they're striking from schools or the Fridays for Future or global movements demanding much more radical action. That's being led by young people. So of course, political parties are going to you know, look at that emerging youth issue and try to position their policies to attract that vote. But I think actually we need a much more cursory analysis, or sorry, we need a much more um, stringent analysis of how the Northern Ireland executive has performed on environmental issues. And when you begin to do that, it's really poor. With the 12th worst place in the world for biodiversity loss, that's on the watch of the executive. You know, we've had my boy and you, you people in FOIL know all about that, the biggest illegal dump in Western Europe. We don't have a climate um, bill in Northern Ireland. We're the only part of these islands without that. We don't have an independent environmental protection agency. We don't have third rights of appeals in our planning process. And all of those are huge blockages to achieving the type of environmental progress that we need to see happen. We are laggards, and that's on the that's on the parties who have held power for the last, you know, since 1998, but particularly since 2007. So us acting as progressive vanguards for change. Of course, I want to see more Greens elected to affect change, but also every time people vote for Greens, it encourages the other parties to be better. So the examples I would give on that those those issues would be. In 2012, we were the first party to bring forward a motion on equal marriage. Now, almost every party supports equal marriage. We were the first party to move on decriminalization of abortion. Now, we're seeing other parties move. In fact, some parties move position three times within a year in order to catch up with public opinion. So when people vote green, they are helping to affect that change by getting our members elected. But it also is a shot across the bows for the other political parties that they need to take these issues much more seriously. Of course, we had one fairly recent um, exercise of the democratic franchise, uh, the uh, referendum on a membership of the European Union, where a majority of people in Northern Ireland voted one way, but the outcome is that they find themselves now outside of the European Union. What, what, and, that, and that's likely obviously to be the the, the situation for the next generation, possibly longer. Mm -hmm. What impact has that had um, in the fight uh, by people like you, your Green Party colleagues, uh, who want to see the kind of environmental progress that you talked about a moment ago? I mean, uh, how uh, does it fill you with despair or how exactly do you react? Um, you know, we saw Brexit as an environmental issue, Paul, and I think you know, if you look at our legislation and regulation UK wide in relation to whether food standards are and water quality, environment, the biodiversity, so much of that comes from our membership, the European Union. And my skepticism about those Brexiteers is the first thing they want to do is a bonfire of regulations. You know, they've said that they've been explicit about it. And that's about rolling back on whether it's workers rights and um, minority rights environmental regulations, food safety standards. And I think something that we really need to keep a watch and brief on is the trade deals that the UK government is exploring around the world. I, I'm hard feared of chlorinated chicken entering our food streams. I'm hard feared of hormone fed beef entering our food streams because of part of those new trade deals that the UK is seeking to chase. Now, so are, I think there are arguing that those who say that that will not be the you know the outcome of this that 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 Britain will stand up and have its own very high standards and it will resist any such uh, insistence on the part of of for example American business. Yeah, and you know that that's a fair argument, but I I would look at what's happening in the UK at the moment, and I would say the environmental bill is being delayed once again. Um, you know, and and that was a promise to keep parity with. Um, EU-wide standards, but why are we delaying a bill if we if we want to to have parity? That obviously makes me suspicious, and I 
I wouldn't trust a Tory Prime Minister on the issues of environmental regulation um, or food safety standards. Um, so, so I'm really concerned about that, and I think we really need to keep a watching brief on it. I would hope that actually pressure through our own NI Assembly would see us maintain many of those standards. Um, but I don't, um, I don't necessarily think that the indicators are good. If you look back at the NI executives going for growth strategy, that was about moving away from our traditional small farm holdings or family farms or small businesses and actually moving towards a more industrialized um, farming model, which is about export markets so we can ship pork and chicken, particularly to China. And that leads to an impact on our biodiversity because of the ammonia emissions that can come from agriculture. So I'd be really concerned about that as well, Paul. It's amazing, you know, we've kind of been we talked about issues that have evolved over the course of the last 100 years, and I'm thinking that the world is going to change so much, uh, maybe more dramatically, not the next 100 years, the next 10, the next 20 years, the growth of China and India and all of this, you know, uh, we don't know what's going to happen with the UK um, over Brexit and all of that. But the one thing we have learned in the, la in the, in the last half hour or so, uh, Maggie, is that, that the Green Party may be most concerned about uh, the, the green issue and the well-being of the planet but you have views on so many other issues that you know from the global down to the very local all politics are local and all that mm -hmm. but thanks a million for joining us and for sharing your views on uh on partition and on everything that has ensued from that uh, decision 100 years ago and uh it's been an education talking to you so thanks, sir, Mario. Well, thanks very much indeed for for joining well, us here on on the line perspectives on partition <laughs>